I uh, talk about the jump smash, which is mainly focused on how to increase the speed of your smash. I would like to congratulate all the speakers who have spoken till now, and you know, and especially DVR sir. Uh, the talks have been really uh, very great and very informative. So again, congratulations to all the speakers for a beautiful presentation before me. I would begin with my talk. Now for starters, let uh, me tell you… One second, sorry to interrupt, doctor. Uh, there is small uh, noise then and there. This is a very important subject. Uh, out of this session, many came to me and asked me about how to increase the power for the shots and jump shot, drop shot and all. Uh, someone asked me about the question also. So please, those who want to uh, seriously get into this topic, please come inside. And those who are inside, please maintain the silence. Uh, this is my small request. Please maintain silence because you no… Know, uh, the presentation, it will not be able to uh, reach to all the audience, so please maintain silence. And uh, other people outside who are having their refreshments, they can carry their tea and coffee inside, no issues at all. You can please come inside and uh, take this important session. Uh, you can continue, doctor. Yeah, thank you. So, so for the jump smash, for, the st for starters, let me tell you that jump smash is the most powerful stroke in badminton. They call it seal the deal shot. And as we all know, badminton is the fastest racket sport on earth and jump shot being the fastest of the shorts, shots. It's an uh, advanced level offensive shot. So I, for amateurs, it may not be the shot they can play easily. Because the speed that the professional shuttlers tend to achieve with this shot is somewhere around 425 kilometers per hour. And this guy, uh, Tan Boon Hyong from Malaysia, he has a Guinness record, although an off-court record, of 493 kilometers per hour of a jump smash stroke. So you can uh, very well understand how technically demanding this stroke is. And I would just try to highlight uh, whatever literature support we have, evidence-based support, to tell what are the key points by which you can increase the power of your uh, jump stroke. Before we uh, go on to the next slide, just to give you a feel, you can just go uh, look at this video. Can we have some sound in this video? Is it? It's just a small, small compilation of these. So the intensity involved in these shots, especially that you're not always sure that with one shot you're going to win the point. It may be three, four, five, six shots with the, uh, you know, the competitive level increasing. So uh, just to appreciate the... So my talk is going to uh, focus on how we are going to increase the power of the shot to get speeds comparable to what these guys get around you know, 493, 450 kilometers per hour. Now the talk would be covering these four broad aspects. First, it would be focused on technique as a lot of people here, especially Mr. Vimal Kumar said, it's the technique that is the key. Definitely fitness, the technological advancements that we have and definitely the equipment which is the racket. Uh, which can help you in generate some power. Now the first question that comes to the mind of most of the coaches here when they see a student of their, is he or she technically sound enough to hit a shot as, as, as the picture depicts here, the jump smash. There are many key technical points into it which need to be seen right from the kinetic chain, whether his footwork is good, whether he's positioning, whether he's using the core, whether he's staying loose, whether he's recovering fast, his balance on and off ground, is it all these things count. If all these things fall into place, then only you can imagine yourself hitting a shot as fast as around 450 kilometers per hour. So the technique, the picture above depicts in, uh, in one frame the phases of the jumps, uh, jump smash. You can uh, break it up into from one to three is the preparation phase in which you load your body, Four and five are your execution phase in which you actually go for the shuttle and give the power. And six, seven, eight are the follow-up phase in which you finally land up and land up quickly and safely so that you are ready to hit the next smash shot. Now these are small clips in slow motion just to understand you what, what is the preparation. So this is basically the loading phase in which you load your muscles, create all the energy from the ground, coil your spring in the body and you are ready to hit the smash. 
then comes the execution phase in which all of the energy is then thrown up to the shuttle using the kinetic chain which has been highlighted very well before. And then comes the follow through phase in which you need to land quickly and safely ready for the next shot. So the first thing that uh, I would like to stress upon in the technique is that keep the energy flowing. Once the point starts, there is no scope of being standstill. Once you serve till the point is over, the athlete has to maintain his movement. Because once you stand still, you have to restart. And that consumes energy and that energy will lose if you are trying to generate high power strokes. You can compare yourself as if there is a hula hoo around your waist. And the moment it starts, you start moving. You start moving so it should not fall till the point ends. Remember, I think Mr. Vimal Kumar would agree if I say that badminton is a game of legs more than arms. I know it is true for tennis and probably it is also true for badminton that it's your footwork, your positioning and the swiftness on the court. If all these things are in place, then probably you will also be able to hit a good shot. Yeah, yeah I, will come, I will come, yes. Coming to the second thing, when you are in, in, in a motion, you have got the energy and moving, then the first thing when you are asked to hit a smash by your opponent is your positioning and the direction of the jump. Now for positioning of your body to hit a proper smash shot, the coaches generally advise the use of the other non-dominant hand to position your hand in the air to see where the shuttle is going to land. Ideally they say the shuttle should not be landing on your head or somewhere behind if you are going to give a lot of power into your stroke. It should be somewhere landing say six inches or so in front of the your non-racket non non leg. So this is where you should plan and this is, this is only possible if you use your other non-racket arm as an aimer to roughly estimate where it is falling. The coaches what they do with the drill is they just toss the ball and initially you just aim whether it is falling at the place where you want to be. Second is when you have positioned yourself is the direction of your jump. In order to give power to your stroke. I'm not saying that you cannot hit a jump smash jumping vertical. You can, but my talk is focused on how you are, go the tips which will improve the power in your stroke. So along with positioning, what is important is the direction of your jump. Now the direction of your jump should not be vertical. It should be rather forward and vertical. That is going to give you the momentum and power in your stroke so that you can achieve speed as high as in the mid, four, mid 400s. Second, once you are positioned and you are making the jump, ready to make the jump, remember balance. Balance is the key to efficient flow of energy. Anything, be it a karate flying kick, be it a breaking the matki na janmashtami, or be it life, or be it yoga, whatever. Balance, if you are balanced on and off the ground, then only the energy that you have produced will be channelized properly to the last link of your kinetic chain. So balance is the key. And not only in badminton, sports which involve similar uh, stroke mechanics like the serve in the tennis or the jump throw in the handball or for, for that example the volleyball jump serve all which have a, a phase on the ground and as well as off the ground you need a balance. Now when it comes to balance as I said the balance provides you a stable platform to generate the energy then that stability provides you the then with that stability you transfer the energy to the shuttle and with a balanced platform also you have to land so that you recover quickly without any injuries. At any moment in your ground or in the air, if you lose that stability, what will happen? If you lose that stability, the body will reflexly try to recover you, balance you by its reflex action. And it will try to tighten up the muscles to balance you. The moment you tighten up your muscles, what will happen that you will waste energy in that and the power that you generated is now being wasted in getting the balance, tightening the body and as a result, the stroke will lose some amount of power. So balance, balance is both on ground as well as balance in air. Both the components have to be made sure so that you can deliver the power to the shuttle. For balance on ground, the tips that are given are a wide stance, both on the feet as well as your arms spread out. So that's the balance position. Lower yourself, by, that gives a low center of gravity to the player that also gives him balance. Then 
comes the phase of balance in air, which is basically there are three things to maintain a balance in air. One is Newton's third law of angular motion. I would be discussing it in the next slide. Second is hanging in the air, which ensures that your head, very important component of any, any uh, racket sport or any sport involving a projectile motion, is your head has to stay still. And the third component is varying the moment of inertia of your body in such a way that as per the requirements of different phases of your shot, your body is still balanced and you are able to use only that part of the body in a fast motion that is required. I'm sorry, this talk is going to take long. The important thing is, another important thing with balance is staying loose. As Dr. Vimal Kumar said, Mr. Vimal Kumar said that your body has to be as loose as a whip. You have to compare it is a whipping, whipping action. And research also shows that while hitting a jump smash, you have to be very loose. Again, if you tighten yourself, you lose energy. Coming to the balance in air, which is the tough part of hitting a jump smash. Now, what are the principles that an athlete can look forward is first is the Newton's third law of angular motion. Newton's third law of angular motion states that when your body is in air, in order to maintain the balance in the body, different segments of the body must be rotating in opposite directions. That will ensure that the momentum is neutral, angular momentum is neutral and your body is stable. Like in this figure here. If you, if you see this athlete, you, you would see that his pelvic part is reporting, uh, rotating in a diff different direction as compared to his uh, chest and upper part. Similarly in this one, see his trunk is going backwards produce, producing a momentum in the opposite direction while his thighs are extending, legs are flexing taking the momentum in another direction. So this is the Newton's third law of angular motion. Now along with these things, as you arch your back backwards, what happens is the center of gravity of the body while you are in air is raised to a higher level along the trunk and it lies straight below your neck. So this gives the position of a stable head. That is the key. You watch any athlete still picture, be it Roger Federer, Rahul Dravid or any of the top athletes, the head is still till they hit the shuttle. That is the key. Now the head still, what it will give, it will ensure that you have a proper timing and you are able to hit the sweet spot more regularly and impart the power to it. So this is hanging in the air position with a stable head. Third is varying your moment of inertia according to the need. Like in the preparation phase, you are basically trying to gain power, you are not executing it. So you have to be more balanced than moving around. Legs, as you are rising up, legs are not that wide apart but the upper body has to stay still relatively, so you will feel that the player is uh, st stretching out his arms, so the moment of inertia of the body increases, as it increases, the acceleration, angular acceleration decreases and he is more stable in the upper part. But when it comes to execution, it's more the upper body that has to be used. You see that the arm that was lying up, now he has dropped that arm and he is, so that allows more fast rotation of his upper body, but at the same time, his legs, they have spread, spread it out to provide balance to the lower body which is not, not being required at that moment. Similarly during follow up where he requires the lower body to, fall, uh, lower body to give balance, he will, you will see that these legs are spread out. So this moment of inertia of the player is to be varied at every position to keep the balance while in air. The kinetic chain, a lot have been said about kinetic chain and uh, that, that was a very decent talk. As we all know, the body consists of many segments and the power that comes to a shuttle does not come from one segment. It has to be generated at each segment and a lot of evidence uh, 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 telling about the uh, role of kinetic chain. The kinetic chain as we define it is a coordinated sequencing of the body segment. That is very important. It's coordinated and it's a sequence in which the body segments have to fire. I would stress this point very much to the coaches here that these are the technical points which you should uh, see in your player that the segments are firing in sequence. They should not fire out of sequence otherwise the power that has been generated will be lost. So what do I mean by that? For this badminton powers jump smash, you see the lower three segments, the, as he said the foot, the calf, the quads, hams, they fire then the power reaches the pelvis the trunk core, and then it reaches the upper body, then finally the shoulder, upper arm, the forearm, and then the wrist and the racket. So this is the order in which it has to fire. If it doesn't fire in this order, the power will be lost. Maybe you will get imbalanced and you won't be able to deliver the power. So the power is generated by the proximal large muscle groups. They are amplified at each level as the power moves ahead. And then finally the maximum energy with the minimum loss of energy is delivered to the end point which is the racket. Now, this is an interesting question. Everybody knows kinetic chain is important. We had a talk, a very good talk about it. 
And what is do what are those scientific is there any scientific evidence that is a certain segments of the kinetic chain which differentiate an amateur from an elite power smasher now there has been some literature studies which show that you know elite an uh, amateur is not able to generate that power he is trying to copy the uh, elite player to do the power smash still he is not uh, he or she is not generating the power but uh, elite player is generating what is the what are those uh, key components of the kinetic chain i am not trying to say that any component is under should be underestimated all are important but for the power extra power they say the role of trunk a research in 2013 and in young he showed that he compared many athletes and he saw that as the angular rotational movement of the torso increased the release speed of the shuttle also increased so that's that's a core that's the first important the missing link you will see the players amateurs jumping turning but they are not using the core you have to use the core not only in the rotational fashion but also stretching it out to ensure that there is a stretch shorten cycle of the you know the rectus in front and use that power to hit the shuttle second most important is the role of the forearm pronation now this is something this is you know this is the last almost the last link of your kinetic chain and in a hurry to hit the smash or if you are not well trained you might miss miss this pronation movement of your forearm which is the difference there a lot of research which is the difference between again a college le college level player and elite player this uh, article by Sai, uh, by Sai he sh compared uh, the different links and he found that the elite players were able to generate significantly higher you see 1035 uh, speed and as compared to 538 just because they found that the pronation speed of the forearm of the uh, elite players was higher that last link they use that last link to give that extra bit of power so this video if you can appreciate what i mean by pronation the slow motion video try to look at the forearm pronation there you see this this goes and this pronates this pronates this forearm pronation is the last link of your kinetic chain and that if if you are trained well to fire that you can achieve now this i don't want to offend but these are two simple drills most of them might be using it how you train your athlete to fire the core and how you train your athlete to fire the forearm pronators core you just make him sit down at the baseline no use of legs nothing just feed in the shuttles ask her or him to use the core to hit the shuttle as far as they can similarly for the pronation feed him the shuttles and ask him just to use the forearm pronation supination movement to hit shuttles as deep as they can from the baseline now this will uh, teach their brain to fire that segment of the kinetic chain which will give them the extra power in the stroke so just recollecting it you see this athlete in a, a slow motion he is staying loose low on the ground as he goes up hand spread then hand drops down head is still and then he goes for the shot with an optimum positioning he is he is firing the core and the forearm side motion again he is well balanced broad space jumping up arch back arching of the back and then you see the position of shuttle shuttle it's not over his head it's in front of him he goes for it and the last thing is again the pronation that you will see the forearm coming to pronate so this is how the, the technique should be now once the technique part is done the biggest question is is your player fit enough to hit a jump smash i mean you will see the malaysians the koreans chinese the hitting jump smash in and out four five six in a row but not to offend again we see that not more of our indian players do that i don't say they are not fit but fitness is definitely one component and there has been studies studying the physiological profile of these players and based on those articles they have just listed around six aspects of your fitness which you need to have not only for badminton but specifically for jump smash flexibility speed agility aerobic ability certain muscular characteristics and definitely your body composition coming to the body composition now badminton is not a game of for tall people it's not that you want to be 6 feet 5 or no the average height for badminton men's players is around 5 feet 8 to 6 if you are a little bit taller you might have a benefit in your jump smash because you will be able to reach and take the shuttle at a higher point but that doesn't mean that if you are not you cannot do that because if you are tall you have some extra body mass you have to have the muscles to carry that extra body mass to the height fat fat definitely is a factor the players who intend to hit a jump smash should have a lean body mass you can't expect person like me to hit a jump smash i'm sorry so you need to have 
lean body mass because a fat not only increases the energy expenditure but the heat that is generated in your body during the play it decreases the heat loss during that play somatotype it has already been uh, highlighted in the previous slides the meso ectomorphic somatotype in which you are lean as well as muscular is suited for the game of jump smash if you are endomorphic forget it you can't hit a jump smash and uh, there is no no chance of hitting it with a power aerobic ability now what happens that when the badminton is a game in which you have frequent five six shots drop shot going back going this way going that way rapid movements that anaerobic break up, breakdown happens during that part of the game phosphocreatine is a substance chemical substance in your muscles that provides the rapid energy that is used up very quickly now between two points you have maybe 10 seconds or 15 seconds of time in which you re need to regenerate that phosphocreatine in your muscles because if that is generated then you play the next a rapid game. So if you have a good aerobic ability, that is the VO2 max, that the oxygen that you can consume per, mil, per ml per kg body weight per minute, if you have that high VO2 capacity, then you can regenerate that phosphocreatine. And that phosphocreatine is uh, regenerated, you can reapply it in the next. To, for that aerobic ability, uh, it is advised that all badminton athletes should at least once in a week go for these endurance training activities like a long cycling trip, swimming, running, all these are advised as I was saying that he used to, he still runs 10 kilometers. Muscular characteristics, most of us know that. For a push-off, you need a good hamstring quads, calf, calf eccentric strength, there are exercises available for it. As I said, it's not going to be one stroke that will finish the point. Now players have advanced, You're five, six, seven, at a row you have to fire. You need upper body endurance, it should not fatigue. So you must do certain exercises, which are off-court exercises, which also recreate you to do some upper body strengthening. Core, definitely it's a core house of power. You cannot ignore the core. Shoulder, cuff muscles, the scapula are important. Exercise to strengthen that are important. And again, I would stress forearm pronators and supinators. Find something to do that. Strengthen the forearm pronators and supinators. Speed is the second thing. Now, in the jump smash, mostly you will be standing in the mid court. The opponent will flash the shuttle high and you have to move backwards. So it's the backward movement speed that is more important than the forward movement speed. And for that, improving that, you need to have some on court drills. Flexibility, the amount of you know, the arching of the back, the knees going back, the thighs and going in extension, flexion. This needs a lot of body flexibility. For hitting a jump smash, you need to have an above average flexibility of the shoulder, hip and trunk. This flexibility will ensure that the stretch shorten cycle is improved, you are injury free and you are efficiently delivering that power to the shuttle. Agility. Agility is your ability to change the direction quickly and precisely without losing balance. And for agility, it is crucial for positioning and for agility, what you need is correct footwork technique. I'm sure all the coaches here and the players would be following these things. So in a nutshell, when as sir said that you have to find out those talents at the age of 16, 17, who are those who, ca who are capable of hitting the jump smash? Just go through these, uh, does, does the bunch of players you are coaching, do, these, do they have these features? and then you can select them for the smash. The equipment has also been discussed very well. Now what I would like to highlight, when you think about equipment, there is a balance. You, I, if you go for power, you will lose on control. If you go for control, the power you will have to generate. So saying that which racket suits a particular person is very difficult and it can only be decided by heat and trial method. Now Yonex Falana band, will, you can give him and say you can go hit with that, no. It is a hit and trial method. You have to customize it according to the player's uh, technical skills. So when you decide how to choose a racket, there are four things, the swing weight, the tension of the racket, the balance point of the racket, and the stiffness of the racket. As has been highlighted, stiff rackets. You know what happens with the stiff rackets? The research by Quan about the racket designs has shown if the racket is more flexible, definitely it seems it will give more power. But again, as I said, it's a seesaw. You go for more power, you lose control. But there is research has shown that as the stiffness of the racket is increased, definitely control increases, but only up to a small, uh, up to a base level. Beyond that, if you increase the stiffness, the uh, the uh, the, power, the control won't increase further. So you can stay at that point and choose that stiff racket which gives you stiffness with power. Coming with swing weight, as has been said, a, a, he a heavy racket with a good heavy uh, head will have a high velocity. But again. Going for swing weights, it has been shown in research that you should optimize the swing weight of your racket on the base of control, not on power. Power is something that you will see has to be generated by your technique. 
again racket shape isometric and round go for isometric large sweet spot more power but stroke variability increases control is lost so again they prefer a round racket string tension research shows that as you de decrease the skin uh, string tension the velocity of the shuttle increases but again at the loss of control so again low string tensions are not favored by the athletes they go for higher string tension balance point as has been shown head heavy rackets tend to produce more power than uh, those head of headlight material of racket sir started maybe with a wooden but now we have moved to uh, aluminium or graphite rackets which are durable lightweight produce high racket velocity and impart high speed so in nutshell which racket to choose for pros the advice is control is the key the tech power of the racket you should not more rely on the material and design it's the technique that is going to generate the power and the control is the criteria on base of which you should choose your racket stiffer heavier rackets with a high balance point tightly strung and graphite rackets are those generally used by pros even those who are going for jump smash use of modern technology technology has advanced use of high frequency cameras speed guns and all these lot of literature support has shown that if you give your player these feedbacks that look your speed is so much and then no look your speed has increased by 5 then he gets that feedback and he is promoted or if you can do a video shoot with a high frequency camera showing the different kinetic chain links and telling him that look this chain is like this segment of the chain is lagging this way then he gets that feedback and research shows that with feedback you can improve the performance of your player earlier days it used to be a verbal feedback or maybe the corrective notes that players used to make or the coaches make but now it has advanced if you can invest into these high level video analysis feedbacks this is a difference between us and maybe some countries which invest a lot in badminton high frequency cameras showing ultra slow motion emg motion analysis every muscle that is firing in the kinetic chain is analyzed by emg and the muscle which is not firing you give the feedback to the player look this muscle is not firing you have to fire that you train him for that the drills i just show two drill examples and you can do that to improve his performance so feedback definitely enhances performance that finishes the talk take home message would be technique is the key to power in jump smash stay loose like a whip maintain the balance on and off ground so whatever power that you have generated is delivered to the shuttle optimize the kinetic chain it must be in a sequence core and forearm are those key links which differentiate a mature from a maybe elite player technique implementation will need fitness not talk it need fitness you need a fit body and the fitness components i already said optimize the racket selection more on your technique go for control more power you can generate and finally invest in technological advancements that will give your player a feedback and scope of improvement thank you